All right, welcome to the, what month is it? It is the May installment of the Diagram It series. Uh, today, we are going to be focusing on uh, software as a service and how we can diagram that and how we can highlight some of the more important items in that SaaS infrastructure to make sure that we're pulling out, you know, what we hope are going to be some of the more important design or more important security considerations. Uh, and we're going to approach this from a couple different viewpoints today. So uh, viewpoint one is going to be, you know, if I'm, if I'm designing that system, how do I, you know, what considerations do I have to take in place? As well as, you know, if I'm a consumer of a SaaS product, what considerations do I want to look for um, if I'm threat modeling that as a consumer, right? Because sometimes it's easy to just toss that icon up there and bam, that component is going to represent my SaaS system. And that's not necessarily wrong, uh, but we may want to consider some of the additional services or plugins to interact with that particular SaaS component. Uh, but I don't want to get too far ahead. Obviously, we'll, we'll talk through those here in the future. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump off. So uh, today we're going to talk through, let me advance my own slide. Uh, we're going to talk through visual rep representation considerations. These are the same things we've hit every single month in this series. Uh, so, you know, what are the most important things to consider in our diagram, why they're important. Uh, and then we're going to get through some design considerations for our SaaS application. And then we're going to jump straight into Arius Risk. Um, as always, feel free to put your questions in the, um, the comments section here into the Q&A session. Uh, we are joined by Claire today, who's also on video. So say welcome to Claire. Um, and she's going to be catching those questions as they come in. That way I can just kind of focus on the screen share. Uh, and then we'll pause periodically or she may interrupt me and just say, hey, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. So uh, but feel free to toss those in the, uh, the Q&A session, the Q&A section. Um, as well as maybe the, the comments area if you need to, to provide any feedback on that, okay? Um, all right, so visual representation questions. So these are the items that if I'm diagramming something, you know, what is most important to me and why am I, why am I including those in this particular diagram, right? So number one, is it meaningful, okay? So does it impact the scope for this model? Um, 100%. There are different ways to diagram. And the example we used previously was like SSO, right? Um, if I am focused specifically on the security of the SSO integration or the identity provider that's involved in that SSO process, I may have a much more detailed diagram than I did if I just wanted to show that I've got this outside application. That outside application is really the scope, but then I'm reaching out to that SSO integration. So it depends on really what's the most important thing for this diagram. And we'll showcase this on the SaaS application because obviously there's a difference between threat modeling, I have the SaaS application versus I've got this other system that's then, it's the focus of my threat model and it's just exchanging information with that SaaS application. So we kind of get both representation there. Um, number two, uh, is it security impacting? Does this representation impact security? There is, and, and we actually, I actually had a conversation with a customer a couple of days ago where we were talking about, okay, does that impact the overall security of your model? And that being said, is like, there's a difference between a, a diagram that's really, really accurate and a diagram that really matters, right? Because I can have, you know, bi-directional data flows and I can have all this additional metadata on my model and that's, that's really interesting. And sometimes that can be really important, but does it impact the security of my threat model? Um, and that's where sometimes it's okay to omit things, just make sure they are intentional omissions of security information so that I'm only including what's most important on that particular diagram. Uh, number three, we want to diagram it such a way that it maximizes returns, right? So have I maximized value on this diagram? Um, the diagram that I'm going to show you, I think, took me about uh, 45 minutes to put together. And that included, you know, kind of some research into what are the most important considerations around um, SaaS uh, security considerations. So um, if I were to spend another 10 hours on this diagram, I'm sure I would find something else to include. But that's time I could have spent working on the threats or time I could have spent working on the countermeasures. So in that consideration, I want to be cautious about how much time am I spending on it? That way I'm not unintentionally spending, you know, 15, 30, 40 hours on a diagram 
And okay, guys, we've got a week left for the sprint. Now I've got I've got just a little bit of time to spend on the threats analysis, right? Remember the the focus of threat modeling is on uh, identifying risk and then reduction of that risk to an acceptable level, right? The diagram and the representation and scope obviously plays a, a major part of that, but it's not the most important part, okay? Um, and then the last item there for, for re visual representation questions are expectations. What do internal external stakeholders expect, right? If this is a regulatory submission and I have to have a diagram, we need to have, there may be some things in that diagram I would not normally um, have on there, but I've included because it's expected of me. And those are, and those are sometimes painful, but those are sometimes also required. So let's get into the security considerations for, for SAS, right? So first off, uh, if you're not familiar with shared responsibility model, I'm assuming everyone is, right? Security of the cloud versus security in the cloud. With any SaaS component, any SaaS application, um, you're, there are going to be some aspects of that deployment that you are going to be responsible for, uh, whether that is setting up users with the correct permissions, right? And, and making sure that um, some of those items aren't uh, set up incorrectly. Not everyone's going to be an administrator, right? Um, so making sure that we're doing our portion of those things correctly and that other vendor is doing things uh, correctly as well. And, and this is where, and I have regulatory compliance and third-party assurance, um, I think, on this list. But this is where something like a SOC 2 Type 2 report becomes very useful because I'm able to see what the controls are that they're responsible for. I'm able to see what the testing configurations have been, what kind of the test results are. And then I'm also able to see what they would call their um, end user complementary controls, the types of controls that myself as a consumer of that SaaS product need to have in place. And those are the items where I would want to include those in my threat model as items that I need to be, be cognizant of. Um, so, and then just going through our list here, identity and access management, making sure that we have users set up correctly, we have them authenticating properly. We've uh, we've updated any default accounts. Um, data protection. How is data being protected in transit? How is data being stored? And, and these are all the kinds of items where I may not be able to control how that SaaS provider is encrypting my data at rest. But I want to be aware of what type of data that I am exchanging with that SaaS vendor. I also want to be responsible and I want to understand how is the data being protected, even if I'm not in control of it, right? So that level of due diligence in how is the data being protected is still going to be my responsibility. And I can still put that in here as a part of my, my risk assessment. And even if I have to accept that risk in the long term, that's okay, because there's nothing I can do about it. Now, in, in, in the real world, right, that we, if we have a sufficient amount of licensing, we can lean on that SaaS provider to make changes in their configurations, right? And I'd encourage you to do that. Have an ongoing list of, hey, I'm not really happy with um, how you guys are, are managing the security in this specific area. Have a list, approach that vendor, make that ask. Um, tenant misconfiguration, deploying a tenant incorrectly uh, is almost as dangerous as, um, you know, having, having the wrong security in place by default. Now, I, I do believe, and I believe more and more SaaS providers are going this direction where, they're deploying security configurations by default. So you're not able to turn off MFA any longer, or they're not waiting for you to turn it on, rather. It's going to be deployed by default for all new users who are coming in, right? Building in and baking in those security best practices by default, and then making it kind of difficult for the end user or the administrator to turn those settings off, right? Uh, and secure APIs. And, and this is both from the SaaS provider. This is also with what is that SaaS provider integrated with? So if I've integrated with Salesforce, for example, and I've got other plugins that are exchanging data between Salesforce and my inbox or between Salesforce and some uh, Power BI or BI plugin, how is that data being exchanged? How is that data protected in transit? What plugins do I have installed there between uh, this API and some additional third party, right? Because remember, anytime I'm installing a plugin, I'm basically giving access to some third party inside of my system. Now, it may be very, very limited, but who's responsible for updating those third party plugins? Who's monitoring for what's been installed? What's the approval process? What's the vetting process for those items? All of those things need to be in place before I'm adding any of those integrations in. Um, 
patch management system vulnerabilities. You're probably not doing any patching, uh, but again, we may be updating some of those plugins. Um, SAS vendor transparency. If a SAS vendor is unwilling to provide a glimpse of how they're managing the security of your data, you know, for me, that's really that's really a non-starter, right? That's probably not a SaaS vendor I'm going to be engaging in. Um, you know, I'm probably not going to be engaging in uh, in business with, right? Because if if I can't trust how they're managing my data, ultimately I'm responsible for that, even though I'm delegating that to them. Uh, I'm the one that you know the litigation is going to come after. So um, those are the items that are going to concern me and concern me the most. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and jump over um, into. Uh, Arius risk, and let's talk through this SaaS model. So um, with what we've done in the past, right, the items that I've got here, um, if I've colored it in red, that's because I went out and created this component for this diagram. Um, and we can we can talk through that at the end if we still need assistance creating di creating components, right? So in this example, I have grabbed, I've got two trust zones, right? Trust zone one is my internet trust zone, and then I've got my trusted partner. Um, and I'm treating my SaaS provider here as a trusted partner, um, just because I'm assuming there is a, a strong amount of third-party assurance being provided. Uh, we've gone through, we've vetted them, and we have strong control over, um, over the, the security of our tenant, okay? Um, inside of that, I've placed a generic SaaS component. And this would be the one that if you were to go over here on the left and you were to search for SaaS, this would be the, the, the component that would show up, right? Generic SaaS. This could be all you represent in a diagram if the SaaS provider were not the main scope of your threat model. So if I've got a diagram and that SaaS provider is just, I'm exchanging data with them in some other threat model, that may be as little as you need to provide, right? Again, it all depends on what's the scope, what's the most important thing. And, and I think here, the most important thing is the SaaS provider because that's that's the scope of our threat model. Okay, so I've got my generic SaaS instances, and you can see like I've gone through and I've I've got my uh, my environmental layer, so I know that I'm inside of my generic SaaS environment, and then I've started to provide um, that architectural layer, that second layer of my threat model. I'm accessing through a browser. I'm an end user. Um, that browser may be accessing uh, the environment through some type of plugin. They might also be you know accessing through a login. And these are going to come from our functional component library. So we've got layer one, our generic SaaS, layer two, our browser, API endpoint, database, right? Where's the data being stored? And then the layer three, I have represented here with our functional components, right? And, and as you're going through and you're diagramming these, remember you have the additional questionnaire sets attached to our functional components, right? So it's, it's actively going to ask, about the countermeasures and about the threats that are attached to those functional components. And the nice thing about interacting with these, and this will be the future of a lot of our, what we're calling B2 content, is this is going to allow you to start auto remediating a lot of your countermeasures and controls from our questionnaire process, right? So this is going to be bringing together both the visual representation and the questionnaire approximation so that we can start to have that faster, um, uh, faster implementation of controls, right? So I've called out my browser. I've called out, okay, I have a user registration process. I have a login process, change password. And I've just gone through and I've grabbed a selection of functional components. And obviously this is going to depend on, you know, what does this SaaS application do, right? And, and the key question here is why is this SaaS vendor different than any other SaaS vendor? What functions am I getting specifically here that I'm not getting somewhere else. And one of the most important functions of any SaaS application is the management of our user accounts, right? So that, that valid account attack technique and sub techniques from MITRE, those are gonna be the items where I am most concerned about. You know, I've got a spoofed website, someone enters credentials. How am I then providing that additional layer of verification uh, or authentication for that user? Uh, and that's why like I've stressed the functional items in here. So the ability to change a password, how are we protecting that? The ability to add new users, how are we protecting that? I've also called out my administration interface because obviously if I have, you know, maybe this is a multi-tenancy or multi-console or I've got a single pane of glass management interface, how is that being protected? Who has access to it? Who's managing our user profiles? I've also called out, obviously we have 
some database somewhere inside of that SaaS environment. We may not know anything else about it, but we know more than likely they're storing data. Now, what I don't have called out on here, and we're gonna go ahead and do that now, I wanna know what type of data is being provided here. So let's go ahead and say this is gonna be uh, PII, uh, and maybe we're also uh, submitting customer data here. So maybe this is more like a Salesforce, right? And I have data inside of here that's being stored. Now, I would want to call out what is that data at each point, right? So I can go through and I can add that to each of my data flows. I could also add in certain types of protocols. So for example, uh, when I am connecting here, I'm connecting over uh, HTTPS, uh, over port 443, um, Right, and I can start to add those items to our data flows. And if I want to move those, I can grab my orange uh, diamond here and I can move those so that I can see the different items. And you see right now they're hidden by default. So as I hover over those, those are going to be hidden. If I go up to my Arius risk menu, I can uncheck or recheck show data flow tags. So it's going to show my tag and then my assets, are, which are a different type of tag, are also shown on there that I can go through and show. So I can unshow component tags, data flow tags, data flow assets, right? So each of those different items. Now, two other items that I've added down here, and you can see these are red. Um, I've got my, uh, my red here for third parties, right? Now, this for me is probably always my biggest concern, right? Uh, because end users, uh, and, and sometimes I'm guilty of this as well, especially with all of the new AI apps that are available, you know, we want something that generates transcripts. We want something that's very easy to use. And <clears throat> everybody has a plugin now that is going to let me go out and, and add a plugin to this, which is going to let me, you know, interact with ChatGPT or it's going to let me interact with some AI system. I want to have a real strong inventory of what's interacting with the plugin system, what's interacting with my API, uh, and then obviously making sure that my users have the, the correct and respected permissions to make sure that they're not um, integrating anything that hasn't been approved, right? So what's the approval process look like? And obviously I don't have that represented here in the state of flow, but um, definitely something that could be added uh, if I wanted to call that out on here. So, and then ultimately, how is my data being backed up, right? Um, I'm assuming they're doing backups internally. Uh, this could also mean that I'm backing up some of that data through uh, some other subscription service uh, that allows me to back up other cloud applications through the API. Um, I would always recommend that, you know, uh, SaaS providers do a generally pretty good job of backing up your data. But if your data is uh, needs to have a very tight RPO and RTO, um, then I would want to make sure that I have backups and I have copies of my data being hosted in my environment or another vendor's environment. Um, and then as well, uh, my trusted party here, I also have the concept of my, my test SaaS instance, um, depending on how data is being populated to that test instance, right? Some people will use an old copy of their production database to populate their test instance, right? And that's, that's a really good way to have a full functioning set of information inside of that test instance. It's also a good way to expose what is normally a less secure environment to sensitive details. You know, so be cognizant of what data is being stored in our test environment, because a lot of times where we have higher level permissions, a higher level of privileges inside of here, and we're actively going through and we're, we're doing testing with new plugins or testing with new integrations. Um, so this can sometimes be an unintentional uh, point of data egress, depending on, you know, what type of data it's been populated with to, uh, 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 to begin with. So that in a nutshell is kind of my representation of how I might approach a SaaS instance. Um, you could definitely do this, uh, you know, with a more uh, subcomponent style. So if you wanted to group together, um, if I grab empty component, for example, let's say I wanted to call this empty component uh, authentication functions, right? I could have gone through and used this inside of my environment to then go through and start adding everything related to authentication into this section. So if I wanted to group it in terms of, you know, data protection, user authentication, uh, user authorization, and I could break out those different security functions inside of here and then turn that into a template. So anytime I have a future SaaS environment, I have a very similar 
uh, approach to how I, I diagram and how I delineate the different functions of that SAS environment. Um, but there's there's several different approaches here, uh, none of which are wrong. Uh, but just you know, know that your your experience may vary based on your your different uh, requirements inside of that environment. So, and with that, I'm going to pause, take a drink, and uh, Claire. Looks like we do have a couple of questions that have come in. We have got a few. Yes, um, I was just checking because some have come in on the chat and some in the Q and A. So I'll just grab them in any <laughs> order. Um, so Jody. Other than things such as wanting to know published information on API connectivity security configs, sometimes I see a diagram of SAS difficult for use as we don't get too much architectural information. Okay, yeah. So if I if I don't have um, a lot of information about the, and I'm going to grab your your phrase, architectural information of the SAS environment, right? Um, part of this is me inferring what has to be there. Right. Um, and if and if I have a SaaS provider who's unwilling to provide me with architectural information, that that kind of goes into that. I don't know. Red flag, beige flag, whatever, whatever we're calling that today, um, you know, kind of kind of kind of starts to raise a little bit of a concern with why aren't you providing me with architectural information? We have a mutual non-disclosure agreement. Why? Why can I not see what kind of security you have in place for my data? Um <clears throat> Number two, uh, you, you can infer some of that. Like if they have an API, obviously I'm, I'm stating the API endpoint on here without really much information. Uh, most SaaS providers are going to have some kind of API endpoint for exchanging information, um, depending on what the front end is that, you know, everything may be powered by an API in the back end anyway. Um, you know, so you can start to make some kind of inference about what that environment has. Like, for example, I'm just calling out other data store. I don't know what this is. I'm not making any conclusion here about whether or not this is technically inside of AWS. This could very well be a public cloud. It could be in a, a shared database of the customers. I don't know any of that information and I, and I haven't made that call out on here, right? So I've, I've left this very generic because I don't know and don't have the information, but I'm focused on you know, what I know I can control. And in this diagram, that's gonna be, you know, I have my user login, I know what type of data is being stored. I'm monitoring for any third-party access into the part of the application that I can control. Um, in the past, when we've talked about SaaS environments, I, I look at this in terms of, you know, the controls kind of have three different priority levels. Priority one are, these are controls that I absolutely am responsible for and I have to configure, okay? Priority two is when I can go in and I can maybe partner with that SaaS provider to make alterations to my tenant. So maybe, you know, I've got a really long session timeout window. I don't have the ability to change that, but I can ask the SaaS provider to reduce that session timeout window or limit the maximum session to two hours, right? So in the event that I have session hijacking, for example, that user only has a maximum of two hours of, of access to the tenant, okay? Okay. Um, so that's what I'm kind of call P2 control, a, a P3 control, I would say are things that I can't influence if they're purely inside the SAS environment, I would want to have a record of what those are. And I would want to have it in writing as a part of that renegotiation process that, Hey, I would like to see X, Y, and Z done in your environment as a part of that renewal. And I would 100%, I would tie money to those controls. If you want a renewal for me, if you want an upsell for me. I need to see improvement in these areas. And obviously that's where money speaks and money helps move vendors. So hold their feet to the fire and, and add some add some financial uh, remuneration to it as well. Awesome, thank you. And then this looks like it's just a comment from Mark. I always document what version of TLS is being used. It should be TLS version 1.3, but TLS version 1.2 for only the stronger ciphers might be all that a vendor can currently support. Anything earlier than that would be an extreme risk. Earlier than not would be an extreme risk. Yeah, and you can definitely call that out on here. So like, for example, I've got, and obviously that's, that's a bit implied with HTTPS, but we don't specify which version of TLS we're using, but you could definitely call that out on your, on your diagram. So you see, I've called out that I'm using, you know, it's going to default to TLS 1.2 or greater, or I'm going to specify it's going to use TLS 1.3. Um, I could even call out, for example, if I had um, 
let's say for example, I've got some third party plugin, it's a legacy system. I could call out on here that I'm using uh, TLS 1.2 uh, or TLS 1.1, right? Something that is quite insecure at this point. And then I could even go through and add some additional representation here where I want to call out, okay, this is a red line. I have a security vulnerability here, right? To demonstrate on my diagram that I'm calling out something specific. Now, Arius Risk has the ability that based on this data flow tag, I can insert risks or threats in the origin component or the source component. And I say origin component by, uh, for example, I've got my component on the left, my origin, which is my origin of my data flow. And then I've got the source or excuse me, the destination component, uh, which is the receiving end of my data flow, right? So I'd be able to see this, this here and kind of call that out of my diagram. I'll hit update model real quick. Um, okay, I'm looking through a couple of these other questions. So I think that answers that one or just, just good good comment in general. Uh, it looks like we've got a couple of comments here from Jeff and then one from Cristiano that we'll, we'll maybe end with. Yeah, so Jeff's one, using functional components can lead to a very busy diagram in a large system, true. Would you recommend using a single parent component in the diagram and then calling out each function as use cases for that component in the threats tab instead? You Great question. Yeah, you absolutely could. And obviously complexity is the enemy of transparency and, and speed and efficiency, right? So like right now I've got all of these different components in here. I could have also just said, you know, empty component. I could have said identity management. And depending on how I want this to look, I could have done this. I'll try to get all these guys in here. Uh, grab my right layer here, all right? And then I could have collapsed all of this down so that all of the functions still exist within identity management. Obviously my data flows are all, you know, they're not, they're not as pretty as they once were because I've messed with them, but, but I've got my identity management functions all nested inside of here. And then if I wanted to, I, I could open this up, right? And I could see what, what's in it. And obviously it's not very pretty at the moment, but then when this goes into my rules engine, inside of my threat model, I'll actually be able to see that nested hierarchy if I want. I can see everything associated with the um, identity management function and then everything that's the sub functions inside of that. Um, all right, and then the last one was, can we please show the threat? So yeah, let's take a look. So we'll get the overview first. So at the moment, based on this model, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm out of the way on some of this. So um, down here on the bottom left, we've got the uh, we've got our, our summary here. So you can see how many critical threats we have at five. We've got high at 48. Uh, we've got a couple that have been auto implemented here and then a couple that are recommended. Um, so then if we go over into our threats interface, we can start looking at some of the different items. You see right now I have the hierarchical structure turned on. Uh, so for example, if we go to the See our generic SAS, and then our generic SAS had seven nested components inside of it. My administration interface, here is the identity management interface I had. And then I could actually start drilling into even the subcomponents there. So my nested component, and then I think I accidentally dropped these into that other component. So I've got two nested components inside of change password. Uh, if I don't like using the hierarchical structure, um, I can absolutely flatten this out, right? And by flattening it out, it's gonna give me components and use cases, and it's gonna strip away, you know, what is the parent component, right? Which, which you may not need, you may not want, perfectly fine. And that's gonna let you go through and start seeing all of the threats and countermeasures related to these particular items, right? And then from here, right, the, the next thing I would do is start focusing my attention. So I can immediately start going in and looking at, okay, what's my current risk? I'm gonna focus on my current risk of very high, and I can start by triaging my way down through this based on where do I have the most sensitive data? How many hops do I have to a data egress point? Um, you know, how's the data being stored, right? I can, different ways I can prioritize 
inside of Arius Risk. And then I think we have one last question here from an anonymous attendee. Um, how can we ensure that all threats related to different components are covered? Any mechanisms through which we can update the threat libraries? Yeah, absolutely. So if I've got, let's say, for example, I went through and added um, add threat here, and I want to add this as a component use case, I can select a component, let's say backups use case. Let's call this, um, yeah, we'll say authentication. And we'll just say unauthorized user uh, gains access, right? Nice and simple. I'll add that threat. And the first thing we'll be able to notice on here, and I'll have to clear my filter because this probably won't, yeah, this will probably make the cut for the criticals. So let me clear my filter real quick and go grab that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add the source column here. And then that source column is gonna tell me where that manually created threat was. And the reason why I'm doing it in this order, right? So you see, I've got all my rules created ones here. Where's my, my, my yellow M, right? So this is the one that I added as a part of my threat modeling process, okay? So now that this has been manually added, I can take this threat and I can move this up into a library. So the next time I add backups or I have a data flow that shows backup data, I can have this threat automatically added into the future diagrams, right? That way, anytime someone interacts with that again in the future, we've improved the quality of our data. We've tuned the rules engine over time. And this is the nice part is that the rules engine is there to support the threat modeler it's not there to replace the threat modeler, right? We still want to build strong security champions. We still want to build a strong security culture because there's still going to be items that it's always going to miss, right? The, the job is not to replace. The job is to support and enable so that you can focus on, you know, really what is the most important thing, which is prioritizing and then, and then going through and finding, you know, the most important risks um, on the items. Um, quite a few more in. Yeah, if we can... More questions here. Yeah. Okay, so um, can you please show the thread if you click on it to check the description, you'd like to see the detailed view? Yeah, we can do that. So if we open up a threat here, so we've got our, our threat, we've got our description, and obviously some of these are gonna have more detailed description depending on what they are. We have our weakness, we have our countermeasure, so the countermeasure is going to close our weakness. Our weakness is then going to, uh, once closed, you know, moves this threat to a much lower risk level, right? Our business impact statements, our ease of exploitation, our ability to sync with our issue tracker of choice, any references in here. Um, can threats be imported from KPEC attack knowledge base or perhaps weaknesses from CWE? So we, we do have CWE libraries. Uh, we do have KPEC libraries. We do have attack libraries. So we have all three of those integrated into Arius Risk. Um, and then we have another one here. In the earlier list of filtered criticals, there was one that was something to the tune of application security vulnerabilities. Very vague. Can you comment why something so general was added to threats when it could be anything? Yeah, part of that is it lies in the weakness, right? So for example, if I were to say an authorized user gains access to sensitive data, that is a super vague threat, right? And there could be any number of possible weakness scenarios that could land in that threat, right? So you have the threat, which is a lot of times more generic, because if you were to think about how many different possible threats are there, there could be any number. But the weakness that leads to the realization of that threat is where we start to become more specific and more, you know, CWE aligned on those items, because it's through those specific weaknesses that allow me to realize a more generic, you know, threat scenario. And we do have a mixture depending on what the content is. I think the one that I, I selected was the, you know, was the one of the more generic components, but a uh, good, good question. Okay, we drill down into the weaknesses. So, yeah, so if I grab my, my weakness here, I can open this up. Right. And it, then it's going to provide more, provide the reference to the outside reference ID. I feel like Anton and I are just having a private conversation through the, the comments and questions here. So 
Good questions, though. Good questions. And I know I know we're just about over time. So, um, uh, Claire, anything else pertinent that we want to we want to answer for today, or anything else we want to we want to cover, or is that does that pretty well get through? I think a lot of the a lot of the pertinent questions that, that are on. on that's top. got through most of those. There was one question around: Is there a way to create a diagram using a language like a web sequence diagram? Um, and then there was also a question around uh, who is expected to learn at risk risk. Is it engineers or key security leads in each team? But that's quite an open question, that one. So um, we might have to save so that and get we'll, back to you, David. Uh, we'll take the web sequence diagram first. So depending on the, the type of language you want to use, you know, whether that's and I'm reading into that something like could be infrastructure as code, could be something like an open threat model or it could be something like, uh, you know, threat model as code. Depending on what that format is, we are bringing in, and, and if you've seen any of our other webinars, you, you've heard us talk about Jeff, right? Jeff is kind of the AI engine that we're building that allows you to bring in unstructured content, and that's going to help you create a diagram inside of Erius Risk. So whether you have a very repeatable type of uh, language that you're using, you know, it's very structured those things are really easy to build diagrams from. If you have something that's less structured, like a confluence page or something less structured, like a chat log um, or user stories, that's where, you know, something like AI can help us, you know, kind of match up and make sense and organize that content and then get your feedback as it improves and works on your diagram for you in the meantime. So, so that's something we're working on. It's something where we're continuously improving. So, and then the, the last question was, um, who learns serious risk, right? Um, I, I think the answer is 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 really kind of everyone, right? And I, and I don't like to just pigeonhole and say one role needs to learn it more than another role. Um, security is everyone's job. And I think everyone has a role and has value they can add to this process, whether you're in uh, GRC, whether you're a security engineer, whether you are a, um, you know, whether you're a developer or security champion, regardless of what your role is, there is value for you to add here. Uh, and even if that's just participating in the process where we talk about our threats and we talk about how we're going to either build better designs to uh, remove those threats by default or how we're going to improve production systems with changes over time. Um, everyone can be involved in those and everyone can add value, um, even on the GRC side where you know we're just capturing those threats and maybe we just want to be cognizant of what uh, what does our overall threat landscape look like? Um, but I think ultimately, I think everyone should be involved. Your involvement may just be less or different than someone else's. So with that, I think we're we're good on questions. We're about eight minutes over and I want to be a good steward of everyone's time. Uh, so I very much appreciate uh, everyone's time today. Uh, thank you for joining and we'll make the recording available within a couple of days. And then we will drop, I'll drop this diagram onto the uh, the GitHub repo that we've been placing them in the past. And I think that that uh, that recording will also have a link of where that's located at. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, we appreciate your time. Uh, have a good rest of your day. And uh, thank you for joining us. Bye, guys.